Hello, welcome back to our class. Uh, this is a uh, Psych One One Eight Eight Nine Six, and uh, this lecture video is about the content in week seven. And in week seven, we are going to talk about learning. Learning is a, a very important topic in uh, cognitive psychology. So starting from week five, which is about sensation and uh, perception. Uh, uh, sensation and perception are about uh, cognitive psychology as well. And learning is another important topic in cognitive psychology. And uh, next week, uh, we, are going, uh, we are going, still going to talk about uh, some other stuff in cognitive psychology. So in this class, uh, it takes a few weeks, about four or five weeks to uh, talk about uh, uh, stuff in cognitive psychology. And uh, today we are going to learn about learning. So uh, you know that everyone can learn new stuff. Everyone can learn knowledge, can learn skills. But what, what does exactly learning mean to us? So what, 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 what is the process? Well, how does it happen? So let's uh, know about it. So first of all, think about this question. So do you know any behaviors that animals can do since they were born? So think about, think about it. What's your, uh, like you can observe your dogs, cats, any other animal, animals like birds, fish, uh, yeah, so any behaviors that they have, they can do, but they can do those behaviors since they were born. It means that they don't have to learn to have those behaviors. They, they were just born to do those behaviors. What kind of behaviors are there? Are there? And uh, what about humans? What, what kind of behaviors that humans can do things since they were born? So that means that they don't have to learn to, to have those behaviors. They just can do it since they were born. What behaviors are that? So, so why do I ask this question so that I, Hope you to think about what behaviors are actually learned by either animals or humans, and what behaviors are not learned by animals or humans. So you know, some sometimes animals just know how to do it since they were born, because that those behaviors are not learned by them. But sometimes some behaviors animals need to learn to how to learn to do that. So that those behaviors are learned by the animals. It's the same with humans. Some behaviors, for some behaviors, humans just, just can't do it. They don't have to learn it. But for some other behaviors, humans need to learn to, to do it. And uh, that's talk about what is not learned, what kind of uh, behaviors, what, what is not learned by animals or humans. So instincts, so we use the word instincts to describe uh, animals or humans ability to do something without learning. So for some, for some behaviors, Animals and humans just can do it since they were born. So those behaviors are because of instincts. So instincts are like innate in animals or humans. So those are the innate behaviors that are triggered not by learning, not by uh, doing something to learn it, but triggered by some events such as aging, and change of seasons. It means that 
when they grow, they just can't do it. That's innate behaviors. Or there's a new season, there is a spring, there is a fall, and the animals start to do it without lear learning anything. So that is instincts. So here is, there's a, I heard of, of one example from a, a fish. So uh, there's a, a phenomenon existing in a lot of kinds of fish. So when some fish grow up, they will return to their birthplace. So they are born in some kind of a place. And when they grow up, they migrate. They move to another uh, water place, to another water. Uh, for example, they are if they are returning a certain river, when they grow up, they may swim to uh, to the ocean, to the sea, that connects to that river, and that's that is normal for fish. So for fish, uh, when uh, for their entire life, they may uh, migrate to different places to live. But uh, there's a phenomenon that some when some fish grow up, they migrate to uh, to their uh, to other places, and but uh, they will return to their birthplace. Eventually, they will return to their birth birthplace, and. Uh, uh, that's that's the instincts. They, they don't have to learn to to do it. They they never read maps. So for humans, humans do do not have that instinct. Humans do not know where the birthplace is. Never know. And if they are not told, they never know where they were born. For humans, but these fish know that. That's instinct. Even though they never read maps, they never ask for directions. They just know it. Every fish knows it. So they, they will go back to the birthplace to live. And so uh, some fish farmers or uh, uh, some people raise fish to, uh, to have a living. So for those people, they take advantage of this kind of instinct to uh to make money so how do we do that so there are a lot of fish farms there's a lot of fish farm and uh uh the, those fish is born in the fish farms and uh the fish farm is connected to the water outside of the fish farm so it's like they are connected those fish farms are connected to a river for example and uh, the, those fish is born in that fish farm. And when the, those fish grow up, grows up, they swim to the uh, river. And uh, the people who own the fish farms do not, do not take care of it. They just let the fish go. And when the fish have, have grown up, they will return to the fish farm. They will return to the exact place when, when they were born. So that, that is magical. Think about this. So just uh, if you are uh, a person who owns a fish farm and uh, you buy a, a some kind of a, uh, buy a, a some kind of a young fish, and the fish is is born in this fish farm, and uh, you just let it go, and this went to the river. And there, there's a, another, a new group of uh, fish. They're born in, in this fish farm and you let it go when they are growing up. And uh, uh, there's a, a group, uh, a lot of uh, groups of uh, new fish are born in this fish farm and you let them go. And all of, all of this fish will go back to your fish farm when they have grown up. So you don't you don't have to raise them. They raise them themselves and they don't occupy your place to grow up. They grow up in the river, in the in the ocean, where well, no matter where, where it is. And eventually they will return to your fish farm. And you can catch them. 
and uh, sell those fish. And uh, that is a very smart idea. Uh, but they uh, take advantage of uh, the fish instinct. That's one example of instinct. So instinct is some kind of uh, uh, innate behaviors that are not learned. Uh, people or animals just can't do it when they are growing up or when the, the seasons are changed. So what is learned? What is learned? Because uh, we animals and hu even uh, more importantly humans need to learn some new behavior because humans and animals cannot only rely on instincts to survive. So they need to ad adapt to the new environment when they are after they are born. So they need to have instincts, but at the same time, they need to have some new behaviors to learn. So what is learning? So what behaviors are learned? So the formal definition of learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge that results from experience. So the key word here is the experience. Since everyone was born and everyone starts to have experience, so they are experiencing the world, right? So uh, constantly experiencing the world, no matter what they do, no matter they are sleeping, no matter they are wakeful, they are experiencing something. And from this experience, they learn something new. They learn some new behavior. They get some new knowledge. And that kind of a change of behavior or change of knowledge is permanent, relatively permanent. It means that oh, uh, uh, David knows something new, such as uh, a car has four wheels. That is something new for David when David was really young. And that permanent change in his behavior, in his knowledge is, is relatively permanent. It means that the David is always, will always know that since uh, he knew it. And uh, yeah, so that it is that is a relatively permanent change in behavior or knowledge. And that change is because of that person has some kind of experiences. So that is learning. So learning must happen after experiencing something. Uh, it's not instinct. It's not uh, uh, innate. It's like something new to that person or animal. So the most basic type of learning is called the associative learning. So learning can be, can happen in many levels. So associative learning is the most basic type. It means that uh, the, uh, the person learns that a certain stimuli or event, a certain, uh, some kind of a stimuli or events, they happen together. And so that those events or stimuli are connected. So uh, like a some kind of a stimuli are happening together and there's a, uh, some kind of events, they happen together and the person starts to know that, oh, okay, this events or stimuli, they may connect it. They, are may, they may be connected because they happen together. So that is called associative learning, just to learn to associate different kinds of events or stimuli. And for example, uh, if there is, uh, for example, David, young, uh, very young David. Uh, David found that every time there is shining in the sky, there will be a thunder after the shining. 
So what, what does that mean? So, so uh, uh, David learns that all oh, the shiny and the thunder may be connected. They happen like almost together. So shiny happens first and the thunder happens next. And then the, the, uh, they almost, they are always paired. They are always paired and they almost happen together. So David starts to learn, okay, shiny and thunder maybe are maybe uh, connected. They happen together. So that is associative learning. And uh, another example, maybe a uh, very young David say, sees, oh, there is a car and that car has a four wheels. And uh, next time you see another car and that car also has four wheels. And uh, David sees another car and that car also has four wheels. What does it mean? The car is always paired with four wheels. So there's a car and that car always have always has uh, four wheels. Probably that a car must have four wheels. So the event, a car happens and uh, the event four wheels are in the car. That two events always occur together for David. I mean, for David, they always happen together. It means that, so David learns something new. A car has four wheels. Right. So that is associative learning. That is the foundation or the basis of all the learning for, for, for either animals or humans. So we learn things not only rely on associative learning. We have really complex skills to learn new knowledge, to learn new skills, but the most of Basic, the basis or the foundation of learning is associative learning. Every kind of learning, every skill of learning is based on associative learning. So there are different ways to realize associative learning. How does, so it happens in different forms. The first form is called classical conditioning. The second form that we're going to talk about is today is operant conditioning. And the third way is observational learning. So there are different patterns or ways to realize associative learning. So let's talk about the classical conditioning first. So uh, people or animals can learn the, the need, some kind of stimuli or events, they occur together, they are connected. They can learn that through some unconscious mental processes. So people can learn unconsciously without any awareness, with, without any consciousness. People don't even realize that, they learn something new. So that is classical conditioning. So in classical conditioning, uh, animals or people learn to associate stimuli together and uh, they can learn to anticipate events. They can anticipate what will happen in the future in classical condition. So how, does, how do people know there is classical conditioning in humans' minds or in animals' minds? There is a story. So uh, this guy on the left, is uh, Ivan Pavlov. So Ivan Pavlov is a Russian physiologist, and uh, he is a he was a person who lived in uh, the 19th century. So uh, like a, a person, a hand, more than a hundred years ago. So he was a physiologist, but once he accident accidentally found that the dogs did not only salivate when the food was present to the dog. But the dogs also salivated when the empty food bowl was present. So uh, when the dogs see some delicious food, like uh, the, the meat powder, 
the dog the dogs create a saliva in their mouth, right? So that that is innate. That is also innate for humans. Humans also salivate when uh, they are hungry and they see some delicious food. There's a very good uh, smelling uh, comes to to their nose and uh, they start to salivate. That is instinct. And dogs also have that that instinct. So dogs start to salivate, make saliva in their mouths when they see some kind of a nice food. But uh, there is a strange thing happening. The dogs also salivate when there is empty food bowl. So there are some footballs for the dogs. The football, when the football was empty, the dogs still salivate. Pavlov found that, and Pavlov was like really curious about this. Pavlov didn't know why, because an empty football was not food, right? So the, the dog shouldn't have salivated. And uh, Pavlov started to, to figure out why did that happen. So he conducted a, a, a group of uh, experiments to test why dogs have behave against their instincts, why dogs have those behaviors. And uh, so the subjects of their uh, obvious experiments are dogs. So they, they try to, to like, uh, he, he, he had a lot of dogs and uh, test the dogs and uh, see, see different things and uh, test the weather and how and when dogs salivate in front of those things. So let's talk about let's uh, talk about the specific steps in those experiments. So let's have a very brief introduction of the processes of those e experiments. So what happened in experiments? The first step is that there is a dog, and that dog is a subject. So that is like a human participant. So present the meat powder to the dog. So there's a dog and there's a meat powder in front of the dog. The dog starts to salivate. So the dog starts to create a lot of saliva in its mouth. And uh, Pavlov knows that. And then ring the bell to the dog. Without the, the, the meat powder is gone and right now, ring the bell to the dog. There's a bell and ring the bell to the dog. The dog hears it. The dog does not salivate. That is for sure, right? So because there's no food, so the dog does not salivate, does not create any uh, saliva in its mouth. So what conclusion can we get? We can know that the dog, any dogs salivate to the meat powder to the food but does, does not salivate when the bell is ringing. That, that is instinct for the dog. So the dog's instinct is to salivate when there is delicious food, but the dog does not salivate when it uh, hears the ringing of the bell. That is a conclusion in the first step. And a step in the second step, Pavlov presented the meat powder to the dog. And almost at the same time, ringing the bell to the dog. So the two things, two events almost happened at the same time. And at this time, because there is meat powder in front of the dog, the dog salivates. That is normal because the dog sees the food and the dogs create a saliva in its mouth. But at the same time, the bell is ringing. It doesn't, it doesn't bother the fact that the, the dog salivates in front of the dog, uh, in front of the, of the foot. And the Pavlov repeated this steps, this step for many, many times. So uh, do the same thing a lot of times to the dog. So the second step, in the second step, the change happens. 
So remember, this step is the most important step in this experiment. Show the meat powder to the dog, ring the bell to the dog, almost at the same time. And this happens for many times. So remember this. In the third step, no bee powder, no meat powder, only ring the bell to the dog. Magic happens, the dog salivates. The dog starts to create a saliva in its mouth, but there is no meat powder, no food, but the dog still salivates. When there is the ringing of the bell, the dog hears the, the, the ringing of the bell and the dog starts to salivate. So why does the dog start to salivate this time, even though there's no meat powder? Think about this and what conclusion can we get? Combining the, the observation for the, for the three steps. In the second st uh, first step, there's meat powder, the dog salivates. Ringing the bell to the dog afterwards, the dog does not salivate. That's first step. And the second step, show the meat powder and ring the bell to the dog at the same time. And this process repeats multiple, multiple times. And in the third step, no meat powder, but ring the bell to the dog, the dog salivates. So if the observing, if it was after uh, observing all the three steps, what conclusion can we get? So the dog starts to learn that when there is the ringing of the bell, the dog should salivate. In other words, the dog starts to learn to salivate while there is the ringing of the bell. The dog starts to show some kind of new skills or new behaviors that is not learned, that is not instinct, that is not uh, there since the dog was born. It was just there after repeating the second step. When the second step is repeating many, many times, there is kind of some kind of change of behaviors in the dog. The dog learns to salivate in front of the ringing of the bell. So that is the something that the dog learn, learns. So this process, is called the classical conditioning. The dog is not aware of it. The dog is not totally not aware. It uh, has some kind of new behaviors, but that process, that learning process is taking place in the second step for, for that dog. The dog is learning to have new behaviors well, there is the ringing of the bell. How does that happen? Because the dog associates the two events together, the dog unconsciously learns that the ringing of the bell and the, the presence of the meat powder are connected. So the instinct is that the, the dog salivates in front of the meat powder. But the learned behavior is that a dog learns that, okay, ringing on the bell and uh, the meat powder, they are connected. So learn, the dog learns to salivate in front of the ringing of the bell. So you can see that the learning is based on instinct. The dog starts to have a new behavior because that, that basis is the instinct. Based on the instinct, uh, there is some kind of a new behavior. Uh, yeah, so the start, uh, the dog starts to have the new behavior, even though ringing the, of the bell is nothing has nothing to do with the meat powder because they happen together all the time for well, many times. The start, the dog starts to to learn that, so that the the dog starts to. Uh, salivate in front of 
uh, the ringing of the bell. So in this process, there are some kind of uh, uh, terms that we need to know about. So in this experiment, the meat powder is a certain stimulus, right? So the because the two stimuli are happening together. So one stimuli is a meat powder. The meat powder is a unconditioned stimulus. It's called unconditioned uh, stimulus. Uh, it's a stimulus that uh, uh, triggers a response. So there is a stimulus so that the dog has the response. The response is uh, the salivation, so salivating the, the saliva. And that happens very naturally. There is an unconditioned stimulus, there is a response. So the, that response, salivation, is a unconditioned response. So it's a response, it's an unconditioned response. It happens naturally. It's an unlearned response. It's a natural reaction to a, to a, a certain stimulus. In the first step, the ringing on the bell is a neutral stimulus. It means that it's, a, it's the stimulus in the environment that does not trigger any responses naturally. It does not naturally trigger any responses. So for the dog, ringing a bell is a neutral stimulus for the response of salivation. So it does not trigger any salivation in the first step, at the beginning. Because uh, the dog has not started to learn Ringing on the bell is connected with presence of the meat powder. Yeah. So that uh, in the first step, the ringing on the bell is a neutral stimulus. And in the second step, when the neutral stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus, uh, means that they almost happen or they happen together at the same time for many, many times. They're repeatedly happen, happening together at the same time. And uh, uh, some changes happens, some changes happen. The neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. Used to be a neutral stimulus, but uh, when that happens, it becomes a conditioned stimulus. And that's conditioned stimulus starts to trigger responses. So what kind of responses is that? In this example, in this experiment, that is the salivation. So the dog starts to salivate while it, it uh, hears the ringing of the bell. So that response is called a conditioned response. So the salivation is a conditioned response. That is a response after conditioning, after the process of conditioning. So that is a conditioned response. It's not a natural response. It's a conditioned response because of the conditioned stimulus. So right now we have a basic understanding of what happens. In the first step, there's a presence of like unconditioned stimulus and the dog has a unconditioned response. In the, also in the first step, when there is a neutral stimulus, the dog has no any responses. In, in the second step, that neutral stimulus is happening at the same time with the unconditioned stimulus. It repeats a lot of times in front of the dog, the dog starts to learn that, okay, this neutral stimulus is connected with the unconditioned stimulus. And uh, uh, yeah, so the dog starts to have the conditioned response. That is a response to the conditioned stimulus.
to that neutral stimulus. And neutral stimulus, stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. So that is the entire process of the experiment. So we call it, we call this process of classical conditioning because it's, it, that's, that's the, probably the first uh, conditioning phenomenon that uh, uh, scientists uh, discovered. So this is called a classical conditioning. And there's other kinds of conditioning as well. So uh, we can see that neutral stimulus in this experiment, neutral stimulus and the conditioned stimulus, they are actually the same thing. It just, uh, we just gave a different name to the, the same thing because uh, the dog starts to learn that the neutral stimulus is connected to the unconditioned stimulus. So it becomes a conditioned stimulus. So the, the neutral stimulus is the same with the same thing with the conditioned stimulus. And also the uh, unconditioned response is also the same with the conditioned response, right? So in this case, there's only one kind of response that is the salvation, creating the saliva. So unconditioned response is the salvation but the conditioned response is also the salivation. They're the same. The only change is, uh, the, the, because of the change in this experiment is that the dog starts to have a uh, response that is the same with the unconditioned response when there is a conditioned stimulus. So the unconditioned response is the same with the conditioned response. So let's go on. So next, let's talk about the general process in classical conditioning. So we only talk about three steps. Uh, in the three steps, that's basically when the dog or the animal or the human start to learn, start to have the new behavior, start to learn that. So this stage is called the acquisition stage. In this uh, acquisition stage, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are paired. They are occurring or taking place at the same time. So that is what is happening in the acquisition stage. That is basically the second step in the experiment that we just talked about. So uh, the, the animal or human search to acquire the, that, that behavior, that learning. So it, it is called the acquisition stage. And what happened after that? So that learning is, is like, is not really stable. It means that uh, if the conditioned stimulus is not paired with unconditioned, stimulus anymore, the conditioned response gradually disappears. For example, uh, when the ringing of the bell and the presence of the meat powder, they happen together for many, many times and the, start, the dog start to learn, start to uh, learn that, okay, uh, if there's ringing of the bell, there is also the salivation of, uh, of the dog. The dog starts to celebrate, starts to learn that. But what happens if there is no ringing of the bell, there's only presence of the food next time, and that happens for many times. That learned behavior gradually disappears. It's not always there. Uh, if the ringing of the bell and the presence of the meat powder are not showing up together any, anymore, the conditioned response will gradually disappear. It means that uh, the dog gradually does not salivate when there is the ringing of the bell solely. When there's only the ringing of the bell, the dog gradually st stops salivating. 
So that conditioned response gradually just uh, disappears. So this stage is called the extinction stage. That means that the, the learning learn behavior gradually extincts, gradually disappears. And there is a, an, uh, another phenomenon associated with classical condition that is interesting. If the condition the stimulus disappears for a short time of short period of time, and uh, there's something new happens, the conditioned response will show up again after the extinction stage. When, when the conditioned response totally disappears and the con uh, when, when the conditioned response totally disappears, and then the conditioned stimulus disappears for a period of time, then the conditioned response will come back, will come back, and it, it's like a, the retaining of the conditioned response without the uh, uh, pairing without the pairing of the unconditioned stimulus. But uh, also goes through a extinction stage. It means that the, the condition response will eventually disappear. So this stage is called the spontaneous recovery. So it's like a recovery of the conditioned response in this stage without any like, uh, uh, without any showing up of the conditioned stimulus. So there is a graph on the right that shows how it happens, the general process of classical conditioning. So you can see on the x-axis is the time, on the y-axis is the strength of the classical response, uh, conditioned response. So strength of the conditioned response is like how strong the response is. It's like a uh, salivation to the ringing of the bell for that dog. So when the conditioned response is very strong, it's very high, the strength is really high. It means that uh, the dog salivates a lot in front of uh, the ringing of the bell every time. When the strength of the conditioned response is low, for example, uh, the dog does not really salivate a lot or does not uh, salivate every time when there is ringing of the bell. So when, when we observe that, we see that uh, the strength of the conditioned response is very low. So in the acquisition stage, this is the acquisition stage. In this stage, because the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus are happening together every time. So the dog quickly, quickly learns that, uh, uh, quickly have the, that uh, conditioned response. So the strength goes high quickly. You can see at the last time, the, the strength of the uh, conditioned response is very high. And in the second stage, there's the extinction. In this stage, only conditioned stimulus is present. There are no, there's there are no pairing. There's no uh, two things happening together. It's not case. There's only conditioned stimulus, only ringing on the bell. So that the, the conditioned response starts to disappear. So you can see the strength of the conditioned response goes down quickly, goes on quickly, the, the curve is like this. So you can see at the, at the end of the extinction stage, the strength of the condition response goes to zero. There's no condition res res response anymore. And there's a pulse. In this pulse, the condition, the stimulus disappears for a short period of time. And you can see in this stage, that's the spontaneous recovery. Suddenly there is some kind of a strength of uh, the conditioned response, but this, that strength is not as high as here. You can see the strength here 
at the end of acquisition stage, the, the strength of the condition response is very high. But here in the spontaneous recovery stage of the condition, the response, the strength is not that high. It's relatively low, but it, it happens. And uh, that kind of a recovery of condition response starts to quickly extinct, start to disappear quickly. It eventually it di disappears totally. So that is a general uh, process of classical conditioning. So uh, after classical conditioning, the change, the learning of the acquisition of new behavior does not exist forever. It only exists for a very short period of time. When the pairing is not there anymore, uh, the response, the conditioned response, the new behavior starts to be, uh, disappear. But that is very the basis of uh, learning for animals and for humans. If the uh, the pairing of condition and unconditioned stimulus always happen, you can see you can see see something like always pairing. That uh, condition and response never disappears, right? So if you, for example, if you see the sound in the morning, the, the, the sound comes from the east direction. Every day, every day you see the sound comes from the east. It's like the, the, the east is paired with the coming of the sound. The two things are always paired together every day. What do you learn? You learn that uh, the sound always comes from the east and it goes down, to, uh, yeah, it always comes from the east every morning. That's, that is something learn, new that uh, you learn. Uh, what, you, you didn't know that uh, uh, before, but you, you observe that, you see that every morning and you have that new knowledge. That knowledge is relatively very uh, long-term because it happens all the time, happens every day. It is always the case. So that is like the conditioning process that takes place forever. Yeah. So, you know, some kind of a pairing is relatively short period like the President's Food and Ringing of the Bell. They happen at the same time for only a few times. So the learning process is not very short. If some kind of stimulus is paired with another stimulus all the time, the learning is very, very short. That uh, uh, maybe that uh, uh, the condition uh, response never disappears. So any, uh, the question here, any examples in humans? So do you see or know some examples in humans that a that, uh, person does not have that uh, response to a neutral stimulus, but uh, after some kind of a conditioning process, a uh, neutral stimulus is paired with unconditioned, uh, unconditioned stimulus. And then that person starts to have the conditioning response in front of the, the, the condition and response, uh, condition and stimulus. Do you know any examples? So uh, I, I can share a uh, example with you guys. So I heard of the story, it's not a story about mine, but I heard of story that a woman is extremely afraid of any spiders. So it is very, very scared of any kind of spiders, no matter the spiders are uh, healthy or uh, friendly to humans or not. You know, some spiders are, are like neutral to humans. Some spiders are very poisonous, but not every spider is uh, poisonous. So most of, actually most of the spiders are like, are just animals or just neutral to 
to humans. And there's no reason to have uh, extremely, extremely uh, fear of uh, in front of the spider. But a woman is extremely afraid of any spiders. Why is that? Because when a woman was young, her mother tried, like her mother was like, her mother's intention was good, but uh, has had a different, has a, had a negative consequence. So what her mother did uh, was that uh, when there is a spider, that woman was not scared of uh, any spiders at the beginning when the woman was a, a little girl, little girl, but her mother start to create a lot of scaring responses, like uh, yelling, like uh, uh, very, very strong, very, very extreme responses. Every time her mother uh, saw a spider. So since it seems like uh, that spider, any kind of spider was so scary, was so evil, was like uh, too harmful to humans. So the, her mother sh uh, showed the, that kind of responses. Like a, a, it, what it, it seems like the her mother saw something very very uh, scary, very very uh, bad. Like a, some kind of extreme uh, reaction, such as yelling, such as uh, crying, something like that. So actually, her mother was acting. So her mother was not that afraid of spiders, but her mother was acting in front of her. So she started to be scared of spiders. He, she started to, to learn that, okay, that uh, any kind of spider are very, very scary. So this, uh, she started to have those uh, reactions it seems like uh, uh, she was very afraid of spiders. So those reactions are real because that those reactions are learned from her mother. Because every time there is a spider, there is a extreme reaction from her mother. So she gradually learned that all spiders to see, uh, when seeing a spider, that response should be very, very scary uh, uh, to be the response uh, that seems like the, the, that person was very scared. So she learned to be afraid of spiders. So when that woman has grown up, that woman is extremely afraid of any kind of spiders. When seeing a spider, she, her reaction is yelling, crying, and uh, very, very scared. So that, that reaction is real, real. It's not the acting, it's, it's real for, for her. For her mother, that's acting, but uh, for herself, it's not, it's not acting. It's, it's just a real response when seeing a spider. So that's the example of classical cognition. She does not voluntarily or consciously learn that behavior, learn that response when seeing a spider. But unconsciously, she starts to have that kind of reaction because of, because of that, because of the classical conditioning. And uh, sometimes people are free of the uh, uh, snakes afraid of uh, crocodiles, afraid of uh, tigers. Sometimes we do not really, we are not really afraid of those. So those animals, the presence of those animals might be used to be this neutral stimulus for us, but we learn to have those kind of reactions. We learn to be afraid of those animals, right? So let's go to the next pattern of associative learning. That is open, 
operant conditioning. So operant conditioning is different from classical conditioning. In operant conditioning, animals or humans consciously learn something new that involves some kind of conscious mental processes. It means that animals and, and, uh, and humans are aware of the learning process. They want to learn something new and they voluntarily think about it and uh, learn some kind of, a, learn some new behaviors. So that is the operant conditioning. So in operant conditioning, it's a process that uh, animals or humans learned to relate a behavior behavior with its consequence. So the behavior is done by that person or animal, but that behavior brings a certain response, uh, a certain consequence. So there is a behavior and afterwards there is a consequence. And people and uh, uh, or animals start to learn, okay, when there is a behavior that, come, uh, that brings a consequence. So there's a, a why and uh, no cause and effect, right? Right. So the behavior is a cause and the consequence is the effect. Some kind of uh, behaviors can cause some kind of consequences. That is what happened in the operant conditioning. That is a uh, conscious learning behavior, uh, learning process. So the animals or humans consciously figure out what kind of consequences are falling what kind of uh, behaviors? That is operant conditioning. Uh, so operant conditioning is discovered by the psychologist uh, B.F. Skinner. So you might be very familiar with this name because we talk about this guy in chapter one. So he was a very famous and important person in behaviorism. So behaviorism is a uh, philosophy of uh, psychology in the 20th century. So uh, behaviorism uh, used to be the dominating or mainstream principle that uh, psychology used to study psychology. And the behavior schemer is a very famous behaviorist psychologist. He did a, a series of experiments to discover uh, operant conditioning. Learn how, how, like discover how animals learn through operant conditioning. Uh, yeah. So this is a photo of B.F. Skinner when he was relatively young. And in this picture on the right is a tool in the experiment that we have Skinner used to discover operant conditioning. It is also called a Skinner box. Yeah. And the subjects in, the, in his experiments are mice, also animals. And also uh, he put the mice in the Skinner box to discover how the mice learn some kind of behavior is associated with some kind of consequences. So what is, what is the uh, exact process in the experiment? So let's introduce the Skinner box first. You can see the, my, and the mouse is in the Skinner box. In the, in the box, there is a speaker here. Uh, so the experimenters can talk to the speaker or make some sounds so that uh, the mouse can hear the sound from the skin, uh, speaker. And there are two lights here, you can see red light and blue lights. There are two lights. And here is a lever. And lever can be moved. So the mouse can use the leg to press the lever. So the lever can be moved. So the, the lever can be pressed. And there is a dispenser here, you can see. 
So the food may show up in the dispenser. So the, because the experimenter outside of this box can give the food inside uh, to, to the box. So the, the food might uh, show up in the dispenser. And you can see on the floor of this box, there are some kind of uh, metal sticks. And uh, there can be electric current through those, that there can be electrical, uh, electrical uh, current through those uh, metal sticks. And uh, it might happen. So you can, you can know the basic structure of the uh, Skinner box. There is speaker, there are two lights, there is lever that can be pressed and there is a dispenser that food might show up. There, is a, there are uh, a lot of metal sticks on the floor. And uh, in the first situation, let's see, the mouse in the Skinner box, uh, the mouse is uh, very hungry and uh, he, uh, it uh, stays in the box for a very long time. The mouse is very hungry. And uh, he tries to get the food. He tries to get food. And uh, at the beginning, the mouse does not know what to do, how to do it. So it just, uh, it's just exploring. And then suddenly the mouse presses the lever Here, the mouse just presses lever and just uh, try different things. And suddenly the food appears in the dispenser. There is some kind of food in the dispenser after the mouse presses the lever. So what, what does it mean? And this process repeats many times. What does the mouse learn? But yeah, we, we can learn that uh, when pressing the lever every time, there will be a new food in the food dispenser in the Skinner box. What can we learn? What does the mouse learn? The mouse learns that pressing the lever brings a certain consequence. That consequence is the showing up of the food in the dispenser, right? So the mouse starts to build the connection between pressing the lever and the showing up of the food in the dispenser. Pressing the lever causes the presence of the food. So pressing lever, food, pressing the, le the lever, food. Mouse starts to learn that. That's the first uh, situation. So once the mouse learns that when pressing the bar, the food will be there. So the mouse will more frequently press the bar to get the food. Because what the food is what the mouse wants, right? So the mouse will more likely, more frequently press the bar, press the lever so that uh, it can get the food. So this whole process is about positive reinforcement. It means that the something is added to increase the likelihood of the behavior. So something is added in the environment. And uh, when, this, uh, when something is added to, to, to the environment, the likelihood, likelihood of the behavior is increased. So be, there will be more frequency of that kind of behavior when something, something is there in the environment. That process is called a positive reinforcement. Let's see the second situation. In the second situation, the logic is totally different. There will be the electric current on the floor, because there, there are some metal sticks, there will be will, there will be a, a electric current in the in those uh, metal sticks. The mouse does not want it. 
because the, the electric current will discomfort the mouse, that's for sure. And uh, the mouse tries to figure out how to stop that electric current, how to stop that discomfort. So the mouse starts to touch different things and to try to do, do different things. And accidentally, the mouse presses the lever and the current stops. So what can we learn? What does the mouse learn? And this process repeats a lot of times. And every time there is a electric current, the mouse presses the lever and the current stops. The mouse starts to learn that, okay, the lever, pressing the lever can cause the stopping of the electric current. It means that uh, in other words, when pressing the lever, the discomfort disappears. To stop the discomfort, pressing the lever. So there is association between the behavior and the consequence. The behavior is pressing the lever, right? So the mouse pressing, presses the lever. Behavior is pressing the lever. The consequence is the stopping of the discomfort. So that's the second situation. So the mouse will more frequently press the bar for what? To remove the electric current. This process is about negative reinforcement. Something is removed to increase the likelihood of the behavior. So from, from the two situations, you can see they're both, the two processes are both about Reinforcement. So what does reinforcement mean? Reinforcement means that the increase, the likelihood of a certain behavior is increased. So that is about reinforcement. The behavior is reinforced. Uh, it means that the frequency of that behavior is increased. The person or the animal is doing that behavior more and more frequently. That is reinforcement. The behavior is reinforced, but for different reasons. The, the likelihood of pressing the bar, pressing the lever, that behavior is reinforced because of different reasons. In the first situation, is to get food, right? So to get food, press the lever. <clears throat> In that process, such as uh, to get something that the mouse wants, wants the increase, uh, the likelihood of behavior is increased. That is positive reinforcement. But in the second situation, uh, to remove something that is not wanted or remove to remove something that is not desired by the mouse, the behavior is reinforced or likelihood of the behavior is increased. That is the negative reinforcement. So positive reinforcement means that to get something that the mouse wants, do that thing again, again, more frequently, more frequently, that is positive reinforcement. The negative reinforcement means that to get rid of something that the mouse does not want, to decrease to, to remove that thing, to remove that thing is not the, the mouse wants and the remove, to remove that thing, the mouse starts to do something more and more frequent. That is called negative reinforcement. And uh, they are all reinforcement, but for different reasons, right? So we can see that the, the mouse figure out the connection between its own behavior and the, the following consequence. Once the mouse starts to figure out that, the mouse has, has purposes, right? So uh, either like uh, getting the food, either removing the electric current has some kind of purposes. Mouse use that kind of connection between the behavior and the consequence to realize its purpose. 
So for humans, for animals, animals and humans have all kinds of purposes, have different kinds of purposes. And they use the connections between behaviors and beha uh, consequences to realize their behavior, uh, really realize their purposes. So that's how operant conditioning can happen. And let's talk about next uh, situation. Okay, so let's talk about reinforcement. So reinforcement uh, is reinforcement is so reinforcement is something or some kind of a stimuli that can increase the likelihood of behavior. So if something that can make somebody or make some animals do that behavior more and more frequently, that is a, in, a reinforcement. So a certain stimulus that can, can let the animals or can let the people do that behavior more and more frequently. That is the reinforcement. So reinforcement can be given in different patterns. So if the reinforcement can uh, is given on a regular basis, that means that uh, uh, regularly the, uh, the, the stimulus will happen. For example, the food will happen every time that mouse presses bar or uh, like uh, the food will happen every, uh, every minute, every two minutes. So that is called a continuous reinforcement. However, the reinforcement can be given at a uh, predictable time interval. It means uh, it's called a fixed interval reinforcement. For example, the foot is given up, uh, every two minutes. So the interval of the showing up of the reinforcement can be predicted every two minutes, there will be the food. That's called a fixed interval reinforcement. Uh, it's, you can imagine it's not really useful to increase the likelihood of the behavior, which is pressing the lever in that case, because re the showing up of the reinforcement or the showing up of the stimulus is not really related to the behavior, right? So every two minutes, there will be a food. So why does the mouse to press the bar, right? So after pressing the bar, there's no food because the, the, it's not the time to show the stimulus. So when the stimulus is showing up in a certain fixed time interval, it's not really useful to increase the likelihood of the behavior. And there, there is another kind of reinform, reinforcement is called a variable interval reinforcement. It means that uh, the stimulus is given, reinforcement is given after a period of time, but how long? It's not predicted. So uh, for example, the food is, can be given after one minute. And the next time the food is given like uh, three minutes. And the next time the food is given after 30 seconds. The next time the food is given 10 minutes. So the time intervals between two reinforcement, two stimulus, two stimuli is, is variable. Is, is changed is the, it, that we, we cannot predict when the, the reinforcement will show up next time. The time intervals between two stimuli are changed, are uh, not constant, are variable, are not predicted, predictable. So that, that is called a variable interval reinforcement. And also there is another type of reinforcement is called a fixed ratio reinforcement. 
So fix, in fixed ratio reinforcement, it, it's, it is not about time interval. So the reinforcement is not given based on time interval, but based on what? Based, based on the, the person's or animal's behaviors. Focus on a fixed ratio. After a certain number of responses, there will be the showing up of the rein, uh, reinforcement. For example, uh, in the Skinner box, the mouse presses the lever to get the food, but it does not show up every time that uh, the mouse pre uh, presses the lever. But the case is that uh, every three trial, after every three trials, that means that uh, when the mouse presses the lever for three times, there will be the foot. And the next time the mouse needs to press the, uh, the bar for three times, there will be another foot. So you can see there, like a, the, the foot is given after uh, three times of behaviors, three times of responses. So that number of responses can be predicted, is predictable. The mouse can figure out after how many times of trials, there will be, there will be the reinforcement. That is the fixed ratio reinforcement. And the last type, that is the most useful kind of reinforcement. reinforcement. Variable ratio. Uh, it depends on like a number of responses. The reinforcement is given, the stimulus shows up depending on the number of responses, but how many, resp uh, how many responses? It, actually, we do not know. It, they can be not uh, predictable. Uh, for example, using the Skinner box, the mouse press the bar does not work and press the bar works, there's food. Next time, it's not two times, it's not twice, it's like three times. You need to press the lever for three times to get food. And then next time it changed, it changes uh, again and uh, presses for five times to get the lever, to get food. And the next uh, time, press the lever for once and there's food. So after how many, so the number of responses or number of trials cannot be known. It's not predictable. Uh, it can be like after a certain number, a random number of trials, there will be reinforcement. That, that is called a viable ratio reinforcement. reinforcement. So, Variable ratio re reinforcement is the most effective way to increase the likelihood of some kind of behavior. It means that uh, if the foot is given based on a variable ratio, variable ratio way, uh, the, the mouse will press the bar most frequently. It will crazily press the bar to get food. Why is that? Because the presence of the food is related to its behavior. So pressing the bar to get food. The mouse learns that, oh, they are connected. The behavior is connected with the with consequence. So to get food must show up the behavior, right? So to, to do the thing to get the food. But, is, but the, the mouse does not know which trial, which behavior is useful because it, the reinforcement is, will show up after a certain number of responses. How many responses? Nobody knows. The number of responses is not predicted. It's, there's a random number of responses. So after a random number of response, responses, the food will show up. So the mouse knows that. So the showing up the food is connected with its own behavior of pressing the, the lever. 
But after how many times of trials, there will be a food that nobody knows. So mouse need to try hard, to work hard, to press the bar to get food. So that's why variable ratio uh, is most effective, most useful to increase some kind of behavior. On the country, fixed interval way is the least effective because of what? Because the reinforcement is given not based on somebody's trials, not based on somebody's behaviors, but only based on the time, the time duration. After two minutes, there will be a food. After another two minutes, there will be another food. So nothing to do with the behavior, right? So the fixed interval and the variable interval are not really useful to increase the likelihood of some kind of behavior. But the fixed ratio and the variable ratio are very effective way, to, very useful way to increase the certain behavior. Because in those patterns, in those ways, behavior is apparently connected with some kind of consequences. So reinforcement is given. When the reinforcement is given, it then depends on the trials or the, depends on the behaviors. <clears throat> so uh, why we talk about this? Because uh, we can use these principles, use these four ways to increase somebody's or increase ourselves uh, likelihood of some kind of behavior. So if we want ourselves to engage in some uh, behaviors more, such as learning, if we want ourselves to learn more, to have more behaviors of learning, we can use some kind of uh, ways to give us some kind of reinforcement. For example, we can use verbal ratio reinforcement uh, to increase the likelihood of learning behavior. But we cannot use the fixed interval uh, to, to increase our likelihood of behavior. So the fixed ratio is like uh, the, uh, the factory work. It's like, uh, for example, uh, if we, I'm a factory owner and I tell my workers like, if you finish three pieces, I'll give you one buck. And so the worker knows that, okay, if I finish three, pe uh, three pieces of work, I can get $1, one buck. So I work hard to get the, to get the, the money. So that is a fixed ratio reinforcement, right? So re the $1 is given after three times of trials. So that's the fixed ratio. A variable ratio is most likely, uh, is, is most likely be, can be seen in gambling. So a lot of gamble games use the variable ratio to let people gamble again, again, again because the reward is given uh, after a unpredictable number of responses. Sometimes the person loses, sometimes the person gets rewards, sometimes the person gets, get nothing. But what is the what, what is the pattern? There is no pattern, it's random, right? So sometimes after one trial, the person gets nothing. And after another trial, the person gets nothing. And after the third trial, person gets a lot. And you never know after how many trials, how many number of trials, the person will get reward. So that's why the person is, can be really addicted to gambling. So that's why gambling is so attractive to a lot of people. It's because it uses uh, people's uh, innate, uses the people's behavior, uh, uses people's abilities to, to learn, right? So to learn, people try to figure out his or her own 
their own behaviors and the following consequences, but there is no pattern. Sometimes the reinforcement is given, sometimes the reward is given, and sometimes the reward is not. The people are always trying to figure out the pattern, but there is no pattern. So that the, the people are try, trying so hard to get reward. So that is about the scheduling of a reinforcement. So reinforcement can, can be given in a different ways, can be in a, in a, yeah, in a different way so that uh, uh, there are different kind of effects of increased likelihood of somebody's certain behavior. And next, let's talk about uh, punishment. So there's a third situation. So in this situation, I will not use the uh, mouse, the Skinner box as an example, but use a, uh, a real human. So for example, there is a five-year-old boy who is whose name is Peter. Peter uh, lies to his parents. And to get some benefits, I, I should say, parents found uh, find out the he lied in the so that the parents spank Peter. And this situation happens multiple times. Uh, means that Peter lies many times to his parents. And parents uh, every time the parents find he lied and parents spank Peter. Uh, that happens every time. So what does Peter learn in this situation? What does he learn? Uh, he learns that lying to parents will uh, bring some kind of consequence. That consequence is being spanked by parents. So lying to parents is connected to being spanked by parents. So being spanked is not wanted by Peter, apparently. So spanking is a certain kind of a punishment. To avoid being spanked, people will not lie frequently, right? So uh, next time people will not lie because he does not want to be spanked. So this process is about positive punishment. So in this process, the likelihood of certain behavior is decreased so it's a punishment, but something is added. It is a positive punishment. So positive is related to something is added. Punishment is related to the decrease of the likelihood of some kind of behavior. So what is added in this situation? Spanking is added, right? So spanking Peter is added so that Peter will not really lie to his parents that frequently. So the, the frequency of lying is decreased because spanking of Peter is added. So that is called a positive punishment. In the next situation, another boy, Richard, also a five-year-old boy, lies to his parents, uh, same pattern, same thing. Richard's boy, uh, Richard's parents uh, use a different strategy. So uh, his parents find he lied and the strategy is, doesn't, is not buying Richard's favorite candy. So Richard's parents use a different strategy to decrease uh, the uh, Richard's lying behavior. The situation happens for many times. What does Richard learn? Apparently, he learns that uh, if there is lying, there will be no favorite candy. So what does Richard do next time? To get the favorite candy, Richard will not really lie to his parents. So that's so Richard will not lie frequently in order to get food, to get candy. So this process is about negative punishment. 
first of all, it's a punishment, right? So it's a, a because the likelihood of behavior is decreased, so it's a punishment. It's not a reinforcement, it's punishment. It's negative, it's called a negative punishment. Why is that? Because something is removed. The favorite candy is removed. So it's a negative way. It's a negative way of punishment. So it's negative punishment. Something is removed to decrease the likelihood of behavior. It's a total, it's a different from the last situation. In last situation, uh, there will be, when every time there will be lying, there will be spanking. So spanking is added and the lying behavior is decreased. So that is positive punishment. And this time that is negative because candy is removed so that the uh, lying behavior is decreased. So that negative punishment. So punishment is something or some stimuli that can decrease the likelihood of behaviors. So that is punish. So uh, the stimuli punish the person so that the person figure out oh, if uh, there is punishment uh, because the behavior causes the punishment so that in order to avoid the punishment, the likelihood of behavior is decreased. But uh, uh, punishment is different from reinforcement. So let's, uh, let's recall what reinforcement is. Re reinforcement is some kind of stimuli that can increase the likelihood of, the, of behaviors. So reinforcement is something that can increase the likelihood of behaviors. So punishment decrease the likelihood of behaviors and the reinforcement increase the likelihood of behaviors. Uh, so that's the difference between punishment and the reinforcement. But reinforcement can take in two forms. One is positive and the other is negative way. Let's see uh, what is positive reinforcement. So you can see uh, something is added to increase the likelihood of behavior. That is positive reinforcement. So the food, the presence of food is added. So the food is added. So pressing the bar more frequently, frequently. That is positive reinforcement. The negative reinforcement is that uh, something is removed to increase the likelihood of behavior. So positive reinforcement is means that uh, behavior is more, there's more behavior because something is added. Negative reinforcement means that the behavior is more because something is removed. Right, so that is negative. Positive punishment means that the uh, behavior is less because something is added. So because uh, once there is something added, that is positive, right? So negative punishment means that uh, the behavior is less because something is removed. So when there is negative, that means that the something is removed. So that's, that's negative punishment. You can draw a uh, draw some kind of a boxes to 
So there's, there's positive. Negative. Punishment. Yeah, so what is po positive reinforcement? Something is added so that uh, the behavior is more. That is positive reinforcement. What is negative reinforcement? Something is removed so that uh, the behavior is more. Behavior is more because something is removed. That is negative reinforcement. So what is puni po uh, positive punishment? Something is added so that uh, the behavior is less. To, to, yeah, behavior is less because something is added. And the last one, what is negative punishment? So something is removed so that uh, uh, the behavior is less. Behavior is less for what? Because something is removed. So that is negative punishment. Okay. So that is operant conditioning. There are, you can remember there are four ways of operant conditioning. So next, a uh, pattern of associated learning, besides the classical conditioning and the operant conditioning is called observational learning. It's, the meaning of it is very simple. Learn from others, observe what other people do and then learn from them. So you see, you see and you learn. That is not about unconscious mental processes. It is not about figuring out the relationship between the behavior and uh, its consequences. It's just about see it and see some people do something and uh, you can learn to do that thing by yourself. That is observational learning. So learn learning by watching others and imitating what others do or say. Uh, or is like monkey see, monkey do. So. First step, watch, watch others and imitate that person's uh, behavior. And uh, the people who uh, are imitated by the learners are the models. So the learner watches the model, what the model is doing and learn from the model. For example, if I learn from you and you do something, I do something, and I'm a learner and you are the model. Uh, sometimes we uh, involve in observational learning without some kind of reinforcement or punishment. So in classical conditioning and in real, um, operant conditioning, the animals learn something new because there is reinforcement or there is punishment, right? There's food, there's, uh, there's spanking or something like that. That's how they learn. There, there is some kind of a reason for that person or for that animal to learn some new behaviors, to get some benefits. There is some kind of reinforcement or punishment. That is external, but sometimes humans involving observational learning without a apparent reason, without any like uh, reinforcement, external re reinforcement or punishment. Uh, because we have some kind of reasons to learn, there, there involves some other reasons. It's uh, more complex. There is more complex cognitive processes in our mind involved in this so that sometimes you cannot see why people learn from others. Uh, they have reason, but the reason is not that uh, simple. It's not because there is uh, some kind of food showing up. 
uh, is the, the reason is more complex. And uh, for observational learning, there are three kinds. The first kind is called life. But just to uh, do what the model does. The model does one thing and the learner does that, that, does that thing, just imitate that behavior. So that's life. And the second time is more like abstract, it's verbal. And the model tells the person to do what and the, the, the person do that, does that behavior. It's like a, the, it's like a how, how you get trained by, by the coach. So the coach asks you to do something and you do that. Uh, for example, you, you try to learn some kind of sports and uh, probably the coach, the, the coach will like show the behavior many times in front of you and you can imitate what the coach do, does. But next time the coach may not do the behavior in front of you, the coach just let you do it. And uh, the coach tells you how to do it, what to do it, uh, what uh, what suggest uh, what gesture to adjust? Like uh, your hand gesture will be like that, and your body posture, body gesture will be like that, something like that. So the, the model just tell you what to do, and you can do it based on what the person tells you to do, based on the person's words rather than behaviors. That is verbal type of observational learning, and the third type is. Uh, sometimes that we ignore. It's called a symbolic. So we sometimes do not learn from the real people, but we learn some behaviors from some fictional characters. For example, some people, like some fictional characters in, in novels or in, in fictions, in movies, in some kind of uh, stories, in animes, so those are the fictional characters. Those people, those characters do something and you can learn from them. So that's the symbolic observational learning. So it's, it's not real observational learning, but it's symbolic. It's just every, that person is a symbol. It's a character in fictions or in animes or in, uh, <clears throat> in movies. So we can also ob observe those fictional characters, characters and then learn from them. And uh, next, uh, let's talk about the specific steps in the observational learning. The first step is called attention. So the learner, the person need to pay attention to what the model is doing or saying. So first of all, the person, the learner is interested in that person, right? So without any interest, the person does not even pay attention to the model. So the first of, to make sure that the observational learning will happen, first step is the attention, you need to pay attention to, to what the model is doing or saying. Second, second step is, Retention means that uh, the person needs to have a memory of what the model has done or said. Because if you want to learn from others, you need to know what the model was doing or was saying just now. And you have a memory of that, and then you can copy that uh, behavior or copy what the person is saying. So you need to have a process to retain, to have a memory of the behavior or uh, words by the model. So the second phase is retention. The third phase in the third step, you can do the behavior, you can reproduce the behavior. So after memory, after remembering, you need to do the behavior. That is reproduction in the third step. In the, for, uh, in the last step, you need to have the motivation to do it. So you, have, you need to have a reason, right? So you need to have a reason <clears throat> to learn. 
So without motivation, the first three steps are not useful anymore. Even though you pay attention, even though you can remember what the model is doing, even though you can, you're able to do that behavior again, but you are not motivated, you will not do it, you are not learn. So in the next step, you need to have the motivation to do that behavior, to learn. So sometimes the motivation depends on what happened to the model after doing that behavior. So if somebody is doing something and there is a certain consequence, uh, if that consequence is good, it means that uh, uh, that person gets some, gets some benefits. So that's, well, we will see that the model is reinforced. That behavior is reinforced for that model. And uh, right, right here, and we see that, we observe that, we, was, we observe that model's behavior and the following consequence. We suddenly know that, oh, that, that uh, uh, behavior brings consequences, right? Brings good consequences. Brings something that we want. Brings some benefits. So the model is reinforcement, re is reinforced. And so that uh, we are also motivated to learn from that model because we also get, want to get that benefit. <clears throat> so it's, it's this kind of reinforcement is not the direct reinforcement. It's called a vicarious reinforcement. It's called a re re vicarious reinforcement. Sometimes we, uh, in operant conditioning, the mouse does that behavior and get the food. That is its own experience, right? So its own experience. He, uh, it's, uh, it own gets the food. That's the reinforcement. That's the positive reinforcement. But in this case, here, the model does something and get behavior. Uh, and uh, get the benefit. That's not the reinforcement that we do, we own directly get, but we see other people get that uh, reinforcement. So this kind of reinforcement is called vicarious reinforcement. That kind of reinforcement increases likelihood of our own behavior, not because we get something directly, because, but because other people get that thing. That person do, does the same behavior and get that benefit. But that process increases the likelihood of our behavior. So that is called vicarious reinforcement. What if the model is punished? The, the model gets punishment. Uh, it's called a vicarious punishment. So if the model gets punishment so that we do not want to do, do it, right? So uh, if uh, somebody is doing, is, commit, is committing a crime, then he was, he was, yeah, he was uh, sentenced for like uh, seven years in, in jail. He, he, he needs to stay in the jail for seven years. So we see that, we know the behavior and we know the consequence of that behavior. It's a punishment, right? So it's, it's apparently a punishment. It's a, it decreases of the likelihood of our own behavior. We will, not, we will not learn from that person. It is a vicarious punishment. <clears throat> so when the model get, uh, gets the reinforcement, we are more likely to do that. We are more motivated to learn that behavior, to have observational learning. But when the model is punished, we are, we are le less likely to engage in observational learning to learn from other people. <clears throat> so uh, that is all the stuff for today for this week. 
and uh, any, uh, everything that we have talked about in the lecture for this week. And uh, this important concepts, that's the things that we need to know for this week. First, we need to know what is associative learning. And second, we need to know some concepts that are about classical conditioning. For example, this kind of stimulus responses, these five concepts that we need to know of. And uh, next, we need to know what is operant conditioning. And also we need to know what is reinforcement, what, what is the punishment. And next, we need to know what is observational learning. So three parts, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and observational learning. And uh, that, is, that is all the stuff for this week. So remember to take the quiz for this week after learning. And uh, see you next time. Next time, remember to read uh, chapter eight. And see you next week. <laughs>